Greg, and uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you all remotely, uh, and uh, hopefully everyone will enjoy my talk. As Craig mentioned, I'm currently the Associate Director uh, for Hydology at Jupiter. And uh, Jupiter is a, a startup that is focused on uh, predicting risk in a changing climate. So I joined Jupiter approximately two years and a half ago. And uh, since then I've been working on implementing a lot of uh, tools, decision-making uh, models uh, that allow us to better understand uh, infrastructure resilience, uh, vulnerability at an asset scale, and correlate possibly uh, climate impacts, uh, long-term climate impacts, and understanding how future sea level rise, for example, or future change in rainfall patterns will impact uh, specific assets. So uh, as you can see from my talk, uh, I'll be focusing on uh, dams today in the United States. And this is some work I've done a few years ago, and I continue to uh, make progress on the research, uh, basically for the National Academy of Engineering in the United States. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of interest and there continues to be interest in terms of understanding the vulnerability of, of, uh, of dams in the context of climate change, in addition to other stressors that I will talk about. So uh, next slide. So uh, what you see here is a, a GIS map or a map and all these green dots that you see are uh, dams in the United States. Um, and as we all know, um, the, the dams or infrastructures, water resources, infrastructure systems, uh, they, they remain and they are a critical component of in terms of water management, uh, flood protection and other aspects such as hydropower and so on. Uh, so uh, what uh, interested me when I first came to the US is I found out that the US has more than 90,000 dams. Uh, I lived in France, I was born in France, I lived in France for a few years, and before that I lived in the Middle East where I lived in, in Iraq, in countries where we had a couple of dams or three dams, and it was a big issue to maintain these dams, to make sure, uh, to understand the vulnerabilities, uh, to try to understand uh, the operational aspect of, of a dam and uh, when to release, when to store, uh, what happens if there's a dam break. So there was so many things going on about like a few dams. And when I came to the US, I saw 90,000 dams and I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's a lot. So I, you know, I continued to have a lot of interest in, in trying to understand um, the vulnerabilities, uh, climate change impacts, uh, how uh, these dams are interconnected with other infrastructure systems and so on. So, um, one thing that, uh, that is very important and that uh, we've been also trying to better understand is the uh, aging infrastructure. So this is the same map I showed earlier in the first slide, but here you see the color symbology uh, basically reflecting the, ages of the, uh, the age of these uh, dams. So you, as you can see, uh, some dams are relatively less than 50 years old, other dams with dark uh, blue or dark red, sorry, are between 151 and 200 years. So of course, uh, as the infrastructure ages, uh, there is associated vulnerability with that, right? Uh, on average, uh, the age of dams in the US is approximately 56 years. Uh, and what's, what's important also is uh, every year, uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers releases sort of a, a grading or a, sort of a scoring of, of the infrastructure in general. So for example, they release uh, scoring about the bridges, the wastewater treatment and uh, other infrastructure systems. And the dams in the United States are rated as D, right? So A is very good, B and C and D, D. So this is where we are at this point, right? Uh, there are two issues to it, or, or maybe more than two, right? One of it, as I just mentioned earlier, is the uh, aging infrastructure. Uh, Another aspect which is very important is uh, many of these dams uh, were designed uh, assuming what we call uh, climate stationarity, right? So for example, as me, I'm a water, my background is water resources, right? So in the, uh, back in the day when I used to design, for example, a culvert or a water resources infrastructure, we would go and look at the historical data sets of rainfall, right? And we would get, try to analyze and try to 
um, obtain the 100-year recurrence interval or a 10-year recurrence interval of rainfall, and we design based on that, right? So the assumption is you are uh, assuming that the future is in terms of climate, right? The stationarity is going to look as it was in the past, right? So uh, that is one important aspect. And uh, we've been noticing lately that extreme rainfall events, uh, changes in the extremes as well. Uh, this is an example here you can see this is a damage in the spillway in one of the dams um, in California a few years ago. Uh, California had drought, right? So when you're in a drought situation, uh, basically reservoir operators tried to maintain as much as water as possible. And then eventually what happened was they had like an extreme rainfall event. They didn't have enough time to release and the water started to overtop and it damaged the spillway, right? And in that uh, area, they had to evacuate approximately 200,000 200, people living downstream of that dam. And, you know, it, it always like sort of concerns me, especially like in, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, imagine how that would be, right? Uh, evacuating 200,000 people, where to put them and so on. So these are some of the concerns. Um, now, uh, when we talk about going back to the extreme rainfall, you can see here, uh, this is a map, it's not up to date, but it's giving you an idea of how the total precipitation is changing uh, from 1991 to tw 2012 compared to 1901 to 1960 on average. So you can see in some regions in the United States, there is a, a relatively large increase in the uh, total annual precipitation, right? It's up to 15% in certain cases. Uh, and what's interesting here is uh, the, the increase is not gradual. For example, if you had an area where on, on average you'd have um, 500 millimeters of rainfall over a year, right? That 15% that is not sort of distributed over a year. It's like because of a few extreme events that are happening, right? And that are uh, sort of skewing these averages. So uh, my point is here is like, as you have a more extreme event, of course you can anticipate a lot of downstream processes that would happen. Now, um, another example here, uh, about uh, climate and stationarity and how things are evolving is Hurricane Harvey, uh, 2017, uh, end of August, right? And uh, Harvey in certain areas in Texas had more than 50 inches of uh, rainfall, right? I think I have someone who has a question. Okay, so um, Harvey in perspective, uh, you're talking about uh, more than 50 inches of rainfall. Uh, and this is a tweet from the National Weather Service. And what they're saying here basically is Harvey in perspective is uh, so much rain has fallen. They had to basically update the uh, color symbology, right? Uh, they did not have a color symbology that accounts for uh, more than 15 inches or, or so. And they had to, uh, change that color symbology to reflect that accumulation of rainfall within a, a day or so. So these are examples, right? Um, another example is here, right? This is after uh, Hurricane Harvey, and you can see a lot of these uh, bios flooding. Uh, this is an area in Houston uh, that is downstream of two uh, reservoirs. And you can see uh, the flooding before and after this from the New York Times. So you can see even elevated areas that doesn't seem vulnerable. Uh, you can see how vulnerable they were uh, during Harvey. So uh, what, what this basically uh, tells us is we're in general uh, living in a world designed for an environment uh, that no longer exists. And I'm here um, citing a, a climate scientist. This is a very interesting uh, citation, right? Uh, it, it's basically telling, you know, what we learned from here is uh, we have infrastructure and this is not only about dams, infrastructure in general, that was designed uh, in an environment that uh, no longer exists in certain areas. Um, so catastrophic trends, you can see, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this uh, plot, which is showing us the catastrophic trend from 1980 till 2018. And you can see uh, the increase in, 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 in impacts from events ranging from drought, flooding, uh, tropical cyclones, and so on. 
and the cost per year. Now, uh, there are a number of uh, aspects that is attributed to this, right? And uh, when we think of it from a perspective of uh, atmospheric, uh, or from an atmospheric perspective, right? One thing, uh, when we think of it from a climate stressor, right? Or a sea level rise stressor, one thing we can think of is uh, sea level rise, right? And this map I'm sure most of you are familiar with, and possibly there's a, a more updated one now, uh, is the cumulative changes in uh, relative sea level from 1960 to 2015, right? And this is from gauge station. So this is not a model and this is not a projection, right? And you can see in certain areas, uh, global sea level or sea level has been uh, by rising about eight inches, right? Since the uh, reliable record keeping uh, in, in 1880, right? And there's, there are a lot of studies now that are uh, projecting uh, how these uh, sea level rise values are gonna change in future. So uh, this is an aspect and I will talk about it in, in my presentation. And uh, the other aspect is of course, uh, this other uh, plot, which is also, um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it, which is uh, we're seeing uh, impacts uh, in terms of nuisance floodings per day, right? So uh, for example, if you look at the Battery Park, 1940, 1960, we had possibly zero to two events. Now you're talking about uh, substantially, relatively larger uh, flood events. Of course, now uh, you're looking here at a, at a gauge, right? You're looking at a, at a uh, tidal gauge, right? But the impacts are, are way beyond that tidal gauge when you think of it. And I will show some examples as well in this presentation. Uh, the other important aspect, right, is the pop population density and dynamics, right? So the, the, the dynamics and the, uh, the way where people are living and how the uh, population density is changing. So that is an important factor. And all this leads us to, uh, you know, trying to characterize uh, how we classify these dams from a hazard perspective. I think I have a few examples. So. Thanks for sharing this paper. Okay, so um, of course, the way we uh, classify dams is uh, in terms of a hazard is high hazard, uh, significant hazard and low hazard, right? So high hazard meaning that if this, there's a dam break, right? Or there's an extreme event that triggers a dam break, there's possibly a loss uh, of life, it's probable, in, other, in addition to other economic and environmental losses, right? And in terms of the significant hazard, which is uh, now in orange, not red, in the, in the map, uh, no probable loss of human life, and, but could still result in, in large economical losses. And then you have the low hazard uh, dams, uh, which basically mean no probable uh, loss of human life and few economic and environmental losses. Now, uh, in the United States, there's approximately uh, 15,500 dams, right, that are classified as high hazard. And uh, what happens when there's a dam break, right? It's not only a dam break, it's gonna trigger possibly what we call a tipping effect, right? And that's gonna trigger, for example, uh, other aspects or other failures in the infrastructure. And in addition to possibly uh, loss of life and, and, and property. And uh, the Association of State uh, Dam Safety is estimating a, a, on average a $64 billion need uh, to renovate a lot of these uh, aging dams. Uh, and one, one important aspect is a lot of these dams, when they were originally built, they were not basically high hazard dams, right? But as we saw in the population density map, as people start building downstream, right? As the uh, land use changes downstream, then possibly these dams would become high hazard, right? So uh, the point here is, you know, a low, ha a low hazard dam or a significant hazard dam today, it doesn't mean it's gonna be a low hazard dam in, in, in five or 10 years, right? And, and you know, this is another example of the imperviousness, at least in the, um, in the region where, uh, where I live. Uh, this is uh, New Jersey here, this is Manhattan, this is Long Island. And you can see the imperviousness in a lot of these areas is approximately hundred uh, percent and then it, it varies and a lot of these areas upstream have uh, a large number of them. So of course imperviousness, uh, changes in sea level rise, uh, change in, in rainfall, frequency and intensity, all these uh, aspects sort of contribute 
to to the vulnerability of of possibly having you know made more and more events from the dam. Uh, so uh, with that, what what I've been working on um, in my research is uh, mainly uh, implementing predictive frameworks. So um, you can call it as uh, decision support tools, right, or uh, um, forecasting frameworks. And the objective behind these frameworks is to uh, evaluate implications. So for example, the implications could be from a man-made induced uh, stressor. So it could be a dam break. It could be a, a failure in the system, right? In addition to possibly natural, dis disturb uh, natural disturbances scenarios. So it could be um, an extreme event. It could be a gradual event, right? It could be something like where you could explore a scenario of a sea level rise and then eventually explore a storm surge associated with that and evaluate uh, vulnerabilities. So these tools uh, basically allow us to have some telescoping capabilities. So, and, and they leverage sort of global models, regional models, and then as you, you get closer to that asset, we would use uh, local scale hydrologic models representing that catchment. We, we would use coastal models, and then eventually we would use local scale hydraulic models to better understand the interactions. So the interactions could be coastal hydrologic, the interactions could be uh, mainly coastal and, and so on. So these are mainly the frameworks uh, I've been working on with a, with a large group of uh, scientists when I was at Stevens and currently at Jupiter, we're doing it uh, in, in a little bit different way. And what these tools allow us to do is they allow us to basically uh, make a better informed decision, right? At the end of the day, uh, these models are not perfect. They come with a lot of uncertainty and that uncertainty is, is gonna propagate from every single model component, but at least they give us sort of one reference point when we wanna take a decision or when uh, the downstream or the end user is trying to make a better informed decision. Uh, now, were we able to do this maybe 10, 15 years ago? Uh, most likely not, because a lot of these models are computationally expensive, right? Uh, they require a lot of computational power. Uh, but now recently, we've been leveraging a lot uh, from the cloud computing. And uh, what you see on the uh, left is a very nice picture of a five megabyte IBM hard drive uh, loaded in an airplane in 1956. It's approximately 2,000 pounds. And, you know, if you take a picture now with your camera, it's more than five megabytes. So it gives us perspective you know, there's a lot of like uh, stressors, there's a lot of uh, impacts in the, in the system that we're living in, but at the same time, there's a huge uh, advancement in the, in the computational power that is allowing us to do such, to, to implement such frameworks that we couldn't do maybe a few years ago. So maybe mainly this is what we're, how we're leveraging and how we're leveraging the advances. Uh, now the case study I wanna talk about is located in the Hudson River Basin. Uh, I'm not going to illustrate the entire Hudson River Basin, but I, uh, the, the case study is uh, uh, in the Hackensack Passaic area, which is downstream in the, in the Hudson area. Uh, but what's interesting and what uh, sort of uh, was interesting about the Hudson is, uh, you know, one of it is uh, it has a, uh, it, it's capturing a long-term and short-term uh, energy and water stressors. It has a history of uh, environmental and weather impacts, like ranging from heat wave to hurricanes to large rainfall events and so on. And it's also an environment that is subject to sea level rise. And uh, what you see in this map is a, a very interesting uh, gradient, right, showing us the population density. So you can see uh, the population density in areas in Manhattan, Hoboken, New Jersey, and, and Brooklyn, for example you're talking about a population density of possibly 50,000 people in one square mile, right? But as you go upstream, you're talking about a very small, low population density, right? So, and it's also a, it has an energy uh, water infrastructure that is serving uh, one of the largest metropolitan areas in the United States. In addition to, of course, uh, the vulnerable and aging infrastructure. Uh, so one other aspect that is interesting in, in this area is the interconnected system. So you can see here uh, that large areas of imperviousness. And then of course, 
And when I talk about interconnected system, it's not only about dams or water infrastructure, it's about crude oil terminals, there's a nuclear facility, power plants you can see here, uh, electric substations, uh, power transmission lines, and of course the dams, you can see the number of dams here, right? So you can see it is, a, a, um, it is an interconnected system, right? So if you, for example, have a, a failure in, in, in a dam, right? Or a failure in a water system, it's possibly that it will trigger other failures as well, right? And this is again, a map showing you the uh, dam hazard uh, potential classification from high to significant, low to significant. So um, where I'm zooming in is a very small area Hackensack and Passaic area. And uh, this area is very interesting. It's downstream, you'd have uh, Newark Bay. So this is where Newark Airport is, if you're familiar with New Jersey or the New York area. And then uh, Newark Bay is connected to two major rivers, the Passaic River and the Hackensack River. And uh, in between, you'd have what we call the uh, Meadowlands. So this is in yellow, the uh, Meadowlands uh, district boundary. And also, uh, you know, this area is very vulnerable to uh, issues related to water quality. Uh, there's a large number of uh, marshes in that area that got impacted because of water quality and so on. And it's all also very vulnerable to flooding. Uh, it is located downstream of one dam that is uh, approximately 100 year old. And it is classified as a, uh, I believe a high hazard dam. And the area is regulated also by a lot of tide gates. So this, like this sort of, you know, uh, it gives us an idea of how uh, the system is from a local scale perspective as compared to when you look at it from a, a large scale perspective, which is, okay, you just have a bay, you have a couple of rivers, but really when you zoom in, you see all these complexities, right? Which is related to the land use, the way uh, they're operating the system and so on. Okay, so uh, this is basically what I'm, I'm focusing on modeling. And what's interesting here is, uh, this is, as I mentioned earlier, it is a tidal system. So you'd have uh, high tides and, uh, propagating inside this area regulated by these tide gates. And you'd have freshwater hydrology from upstream to downstream and releases from this uh, dam, which, which holds, uh, this, this dam holds uh, approximately three and a half uh, billion gallons. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, earlier, it is vulnerable to a combined influence of riverine and tidal. Uh, it's a highly urbanized watershed, I forgot to say that. Approximately 2 million people are living there. And uh, there are a number of uh, critical facilities. So there are a number of airports, uh, there is the uh, sewage commission and so on. And it is, uh, this reservoir is serving water to approximately 750,000 people. And now, um, what happened in this dam and in this area specifically downstream of this dam is Hurricane Irene 2011, uh, approximately uh, 250 to 300 millimeters of rainfall uh, between August 27 and August 29. So that is a large, uh, that is a substantial rainfall event. It triggered a large number of uh, flooding. And what happened in this uh, area basically is the dam started to overtop, right? And you know, uh, the dam did not fail, right? It, just, it was just mainly overtopping. Uh, a lot of the simulations and scenarios we, we do uh, are related to dam failures, could be from overtopping, could be from other aspects such as what we call piping, erosion and so on. So in this case, uh, the dam did not uh, collapse, but it seems they didn't have enough time to release water upstream or they didn't have a forecast. So what happened was, uh, there was overtopping from the dam, which released approximately more than 300 uh, cubic meters per second downstream the Hackensack. And uh, what you see here is a observed time series from USGS registering the uh, water levels and also registering the flow or the volume of water from upstream to downstream, okay? Now, uh, at the same time, downstream you have Newark Bay, right? As I mentioned earlier, it is an open water, it's a bay, right? So you have uh, also a peak or a surge from Irene that was approximately two meters 
to, uh, from an NABD88 data. And uh, what you see in green here is the accumulated rainfall, as I mentioned earlier. So you can see this is sort of a combination of a freshwater hydrology being released from upstream the dam, right? Uh, storm surge from downstream, right? And then in between, you'd have all these complex interactions. So in order for us to capture that, uh, these interactions, we had to use a 2D uh, hydraulic model. Uh, and then that allowed us to simulate uh, the behavior of the water and where the interactions are happening. So that was Hurricane Irene, 2011. Now, uh, a year after Irene, uh, and you know, things happen year after year sometimes. A year after Irene, uh, Hurricane Sandy, right? So Hurricane Sandy in this case, uh, there was a lot of concern about rainfall because Irene had just happened. Uh, but eventually uh, there was a little, a little rainfall less than 50 uh, millimeters in terms of accumulation. And the event was mainly a storm surge event, as you can see here. So this is a storm surge event, approximately three and a half meters from a NAVD8 data here in Newark Bay. And uh, what you see here is basically that a tidal signal or that storm surge propagated all the way inland. I believe this is 30 miles or maybe more, if I recall well. And it propagated all the way inland, inland in the Hackensack. And you can see what's interesting here is this gauge station uh, from USGS, which is supposed to be uh, registering uh, stream flow, right? Which is supposed to be registering water levels coming from upstream to downstream. In this case, it still registered this spike in the water level. Uh, but that spike was not from freshwater hydrology. It was mainly from the storm surge that hit this region. So this is like, this is very interesting because we don't see uh, these data sets very often where you see like propagation of surge all the way inland, right? So imagine, you know, it's a storm surge, right? It, uh, there's, a, there's a large volume of water propagating on the structure of the dam. So all these things with aging infrastructure could potentially uh, impact the vulnerability, right? And what's interesting here is you can see that the flow, which is mainly, uh, which is in general uh, induced from the water level, from what we call a rating curve, or the relationship between water level and flow, is empty here from USGS. They have no records. And the reason behind it is because it's sort of, uh, there's no, there was no flow from the dam. It was mainly the opposite way around. So uh, this was interesting, right? Because in 2011, you see uh, overtopping, a small storm surge event. Uh, but in 2012, you see a substantially uh, larger storm surge event with no rainfall. So it gives us perspective on how these systems operate and how the vulnerability could be compound down the road, possibly, especially if you had uh, sea level rise, for example, or other processes. So imagine having uh, Irene overtopping with a storm surge like Sandy. So all these tools that we're implementing allow us in general to evaluate these scenarios, uh, you know, to better understand vulnerabilities and so on. So um, these are the comparisons between the two events in terms of inundation extent. And you can see storm surge from Sandy had a substantially larger impact. Uh, don't look at the Hudson. These are like uh, mainly focusing on the Hackensack and Passaic. You can see here Sandy shows no flooding in the Hudson, uh, but that's not the case. It's just uh, missing data that I didn't have. Uh, now, so one of the scenarios I've been exploring is understanding these tipping points. So this is one scenario and one scenario from these tools is, okay, so now uh, I have Sandy, right? And I'm gonna assume in my model, we build these models, we validate them, we, we calibrate them, we validate them to see how they predict. And then eventually we start forcing them with different scenarios. So these scenarios could be sea level rise scenarios and they could be associated with uh, storm surge and dam break. In this scenario here, I'm exploring a, a potential dam break associated with a storm surge. Okay, and the, the idea has to, is to understand, because a lot of people we talk to think that Sandy was the worst, right? So one, one vulnerability we're trying to explore is what happens if Sandy was associated with a dam break or an extreme event, or uh, it could be also sea level rise, right? So what you see here is an animation of how the water is propagating from the dam downstream and also from the tidal signal uh, or the um, storm surge upstream. And, and I'm gonna zoom into a few uh, zones to just show you an example of how these patterns interact. Uh, but here the idea is to uh, 
have that volume of water propagate from upstream to downstream and the storm surge as well. And we published some of this work in the uh, in advances in water resources. So that is one uh, simulation. We have a lot of simulations that I'm, I'm not showing today. Uh, but here what's interesting is you can see, if you zoom in, in here in one area on the, um, on the Passaic River, you can see what we call uh, this, this mixing zone, right? You can see like the fresh water, this is, this is like more of a particle tracking. You can see the fresh water, you can see the uh, salt water or the, the coastal or open water intruding. And you can see these areas look like uh, very vulnerable from a local scale perspective uh, to these kinds of events. So one thing we, we try to understand is, okay, so now uh, this is with current conditions, right? So how would this vulnerability look like, uh, for example, in, uh, in 2050? Or how would this, would this vulnerability look like if you had a sea level rise scenario? And will, this er will these areas be uh, more vulnerable uh, with, with, for example, sea level rise and a, and a higher uh, boundary condition downstream, will they be less vulnerable or will that vulnerability not change? So these are the scenarios we explore. Uh, we explore them, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, leveraging uh, cloud computing. And it allows us to basically, instead of running one model, it allows us to run, uh, in certain cases, we, we run hundreds or even thousands of scenarios to understand uh, the vulnerabilities to und understand the compound effect of these events. Um, so these are just uh, examples I was showing. So in, in summary, uh, you know, I, I showed you a, an example of one of the modeling frameworks we, uh, we, we look at. Uh, and these modeling frameworks are mainly ranging from global because a lot of these data sets come from global models. And then eventually with that telescoping capabilities, they go into a, a, a more higher resolution scale. Uh, they allow us to uh, basically quantify processes at a decision uh, relevant scale. So, you know, the, the, it, it gives us a lot of perspective in terms of, okay, now I, I know there's a change in climate. I know there's a sea level rise, but how will that really look in terms of, okay, what's going to happen to that asset, asset specific? And now I know a lot of you are wondering now, okay, this is one asset, right? How about the 90,000 uh, dams or so? So that is where really I think, you know, if, if, the, if the methodology is there and it is um, transferable and it is scalable, right? Then I don't see a, a, an issue in terms of scaling this on the cloud or on, on, a, on a super computer machine sort of to understand possibly interconnected reservoirs, right? Because this is one reservoir you could look at uh, possibly a watershed that has five or six of them and you can see like look at tipping points, right? Or domino effect, we call it sometimes. So these are, these are some of the uh, processes we are currently sort of trying to better understand. Uh, now, uh, as we, we saw, these compound extreme events could also increase the risk of uh, cascading infrastructure failure. I showed some examples of uh, the interconnected system, right? So you have a dam failing, uh, possibly downstream you have a, a wastewater treatment plant that could also fail. Like, and, and these are like sort of the uh, interconnections we're trying to better understand and we're trying to, to identify the vulnerabilities. Um, of course, deteriorating or aging infrastructure compound with climate risk, right? Uh, could of course, increase that risk that we face currently, and we're, we're starting to see it already. So um, this is finally sort of a, a, a diagram I had, which is, you know, what's important here is to understand the phys physical vulnerabilities, quantify the uh, damageability, and then eventually start exploring adaptation options, right? Because at the end of the day, as I mentioned earlier, the tools, uh, that I've been demonstrating are just one point of reference in the decision, right? And if they allow us to better quantify, better understand, then eventually they would allow us to better identify adaptation options. So one could easily uh, plug in, in this tools some adaptation options and say, okay, now I want to explore possibly having a levy in one specific area or having some gray infrastructure or green infrastructure and evaluate how this possibly could uh, mitigate some of these impacts. So that, that is the talk I have, and I hope everyone enjoyed it, and I'm 
I'm happy to answer uh, any questions if you have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. For, uh, does anybody have a question? Uh, I believe there are some questions in the in the chat that people were posting as uh, things were going on. Yeah, I saw like the uh, the yellow. Yeah, the chat I can see here. Uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has questions verbally. Let's see. Okay, what is the impact of dam on agriculture? I see one question there. Uh, you know, I have uh, looked into imperviousness, imperviousness maps. Uh, I've not studied that in depth, to be honest. But yeah, I believe there's a, you know, there, it, it is a very interesting topic to study. Okay. Uh, I had a question on the phone. Sure. Hello, can you hear? Yes. Uh, yeah, you, you spoke about um, a lot of the eastern dams and, you know, the excess rainfall that some uh, areas have experienced. But what about out west? I mean, they, they have been in a drought situation for many years. And I've been, you know, uh, on some recent uh, visits, you know, during vacation. I've seen Lake Mead, for instance, and, and Powell, you know, the water level is much, much lower than optimal. And that area... Um, you know, um, the water resources serve a huge population in California and many of the western states depend on it uh, for agriculture, hydropower, et cetera. Yeah. So um, is that something that you're looking into, how climate change will be affecting um, uh, the western states and, and their water resources? I have not looked into uh, the western area, but one thing I do... Uh, sort of think of all the time. And, and a lot of it is uh, for my work with, a, uh, with one of my mentors and very close friend uh, who unfortunately passed away was Danny Fred. He was the uh, director of hyd hydrology at National Water Service. And he implemented, um, he was one of the pioneers in terms of dam break modeling and dams uh, modeling in, uh, and, and the tools he implemented. And one thing we've, we've always uh, sort of uh, thought of is uh, in a case, in general, if I'm, an, a, if I'm an operational person in a reservoir and I am in a, in a state or in a region that is uh, facing a drought, I'm going to always be very conservative with the water levels in my reservoir, right? So I'm going to make sure that I maintain as much uh, water level as I can in these reservoirs, right? And because I have a drought, right? I want to make sure I don't lose the water. Uh, but in a situation where you have a a long-term drought, right? And then eventually uh, in, in, a, in a few days after that, you would have an extreme rainfall event, which is what we saw, for example, in the Oroville Dam in California, right? And, you, and at that point, usually you don't have a forecast like a month ago, like, but, but about like an extreme rainfall ha uh, event happening. You usually have a, for a good forecast of rainfall, possibly two to three days out. Uh, you know, we always go out and say, we, we look at the weather, it's going to rain and then it doesn't rain, right? So th these, these forecasts remain very important because there's a human aspect to it, which is saying, okay, I'm going to get possibly less than 10 or 15 millimeters of rainfall or uh, in the next few hours. And then eventually you end up having uh, 10 times more or six times more. So at that point, that's where it becomes, it becomes very vulnerable. Uh, and that's where uh, it could be problematic if, if that dam has high water levels and then you have an extreme rainfall event bringing a lot of inflows or volumes of water to the dam and then it starts overtopping. And of course, overtopping is one of the major reasons why you see a lot of uh, uh, dam breaks, right? And, and dam vulnerabilities. So I have not studied uh, the West Coast extensively, but I think the aspect of drought is, is very important. Has there been effort? I have a question on the chat. Uh, has there been effort toward conserving meadowlands, marshlands for flooding mitigation in the Hackensack watershed? I believe so. I think there was this uh, rebuild by design project and a lot of what uh, engineering companies looked at. I was not involved in that part, but I, I believe a lot of what uh, engineering companies looked at was uh, trying to understand how they could mitigate flooding 
uh, by using these uh, uh, meadowlands as sort of a storage basin, sort of to delay water. Uh, but you know, when you're looking at something like Sandy, uh, th th that is a la vo large volume of water and yeah, it, it's, I don't know if it's going to be enough. Uh, another question. Thank you. Do you have, go ahead, sorry. Do you have a reasonable time series of when the dams were built? And if so, can it be used to build a parameterization for increasing reservoir load over time? Yeah, I mean, uh, there is a time series about uh, when the dams were built. Each dam has a, a associated information with it and that database is publicly available and you can download that data set. Uh, parameterization model, I think that is a good idea, yeah. Yes, I have a question, I think, Nader. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks very much. It was really interesting. Um, I, I'm originally from Bangladesh, and I see that among the audiences, there is a very good representation from uh, Bangladesh. And that is where my question is contextually situated, because you know that Bangladesh is also very famous for dams. Right, it is right. not what dams which are being built by the Dutch. It is also the historical dams, which are um, like uh, it was even during the Mughal period. Um, so the Jamandars or the landlords, they used to manage those lands. Uh, they used to have a very natural process of managing those lands, uh, embankments and uh, dams um, in that area. But as I understand that what you have been doing is you have been looking into the dams in the US where um, where it is more like a state regulated or it is regulated by the private companies or there is some kind of institutions. But when you talk about the global south where uh, we talk about uh, the living delta where the people, uh, I mean, uh, the, this infrastructure is sort of an identity where there are different stakeholders, they interact with them and that has a different way of regulating that rather than having been very much institutionally regulated. So um, I understand that your work is more like the in infrastructure resilience is from the uh, perspective of Global North, but if you could sort of shed some light uh, how this could be looked at from the perspective of Global South, where even a, you know, a, a local farmer, he has some stake with that dam and he has some interaction, everyday interaction with the dam and how they could be more resilient uh, uh, in that setting. Yeah, you know, I think that, that is a very important topic, right? And one thing, the way I think of it is there is no one solution that fits all, right? The solution that you could think of uh, possibly in, in, in the East Coast of the United States might not be the same solution in the West Coast or might not be the same solution in, in Bangladesh or other countries, and I've worked on and dams in the Middle East and Europe. And, and I've noticed that, you know, um, each, each dam it actually has it's a, dif a different flavor, right? And, and the dam I showed today, for example, is vulnerable to possibly sea level rise, right? Uh, vulnerable to coastal storm surge, but a lot of dams are not. So I think, you know, it, it is a combination of, of aspects that have to come together. And I think culture is a big piece of it, right? Uh, you know, especially in, in countries where uh, agriculture is very important. Uh, and uh, in addition to culture, I think also um, investing in, uh, in visuals, right? Because I remember 10 years ago, I would go to uh, a policymaker or I would go to uh, someone who has uh, possibly a, an asset downstream and I would show them a time series. And I would say, this is a time series of water level and a discharge and really they wouldn't understand what I'm talking about and and the only reason why I understand what I'm talking about is because I've been doing this for like years right and I think you know bridging that gap between the science and between what we're doing to and how we're like cooking these models and how we're visualizing them is very important and I think uh, all the advances that are coming in animations and uh, visualization of for example uh, vulnerabilities I think that will make it allow us to sort of bridge that gap between um, the simple person who's trying to understand what's happening and what could happen in the future and between all the science that is in the background, right? And I remember uh, once having a meeting with someone and I went into all the details, the technical details, and they 
at the end he said can you explain that to me now in plain english so you know these things i think are important yeah but that very good question yeah, thank Thanks, you Adam. Okay. Any other questions? Well, it's uh, more, more a comment uh, than a question, um, but maybe I can turn it into a question. You uh, sort of gave the risk aspect more from a regional point of view. Um, but it could be looked at it at particular critical facilities like nuclear power plants or other power plants. Uh, for instance, in Bangladesh, uh, you have the, a new coal-fired power plant in, in Rampal, right on the edge of the Sundarbans, which uh, is clearly uh, prone to storm surges that move inland but uh, could be combined at the same time with floods coming down. Luckily, the monsoon season usually doesn't coincide with, with hurricanes. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I looked actually at the uh, Bhopal, uh, the Rampal uh, power plant uh, elevation sites, and they were surprisingly low given the storm surge capacity of that area. So I wonder whether you look at it uh, sometimes for particular critical facilities or there would be, in my mind, a market for you to work with owners of critical facilities to make a reasonable hazards or risk assessment for them. Yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, the, the company where I work at, Jupiter Intelligence, they have a lot of uh, work with uh, uh, critical uh, assets. Uh, we had work with the city of Miami. We did work for New York City. Uh, we work a lot with the uh, private sector, uh, with um, mainly uh, real estate developers. So I think, you know, in, in the US, I, I feel uh, the market is quite mature in terms of like data sets that are available. But when you look outside the United States, and I, I remember uh, when I was working with the was working with the U.S. government uh, to build a model for uh, the Tigris River in Iraq, and uh, it was very difficult to get data because the water level data was confidential. Uh, it was not digitized. You ha you'd have to go to a, an archive area and find the data. It was very difficult to get the data as versus uh, like what we see here in the United States or in Europe or possibly other countries. So I think it's it's really on a on a case by case basis. Uh, but I feel also a lot of countries that are possibly vulnerable to these kinds of events. Uh, one of the issues that we have there is the lack of data and the lack of, for example, high resolution digital elevation models, right? So in order for you to understand uh, the, the elevation of that land or the asset, you would need really something that is higher resolution than the uh, 90 meters resolution digital elevation model or 30 meters. Uh, you would need to have a lot of validation data because at the end of the day, these tools allow us to make informed decisions, but we wanna make sure that they sort of replicate historical events, right? They, they sort of, yeah, you'd have to be comfortable with that tool and feel that it has confidence in terms of uh, providing you with a simulation that could be realistic. And unless we have the data, unless we have uh, observations, possibly from satellite, right? I always think of the SWAT mission, which I worked on, which is the surface water uh, oceanography, ocean, ocean and topography mission, which is basically about measuring water levels globally. So I think as we have more and more data sets, it will allow us to make a lot of progress in, in many regions that could also have vulnerabilities. Yes, Nadia. 
My second question, I'm a, I'm a human geographer by training, so my, uh, I'm not a modeler. Uh, my understanding of infrastructure is very different, I, you understand. And from that perspective, I was thinking that when you were uh, talking about any infrastructure and talking about the infrastructure resilience, um, yeah. uh, particularly from the theoretical aspect or theoretical embedding of the definition of resilience, uh, how much do you consider the other factors? For example, um, the only dam we have in Bangladesh that has caused huge trouble in a region that has made it politically instable because that has inundated a huge fertile land or even uh, the, uh, the other uh, the other thing that Yakub was mentioning is the Rampal one. That is also very co controversial. Being a Bangladeshi, I am sort of um, not in a liberty to comment on that one even because um, uh, you know that we have some kind of restriction of expressing our um, uh, opinions. Uh, and um, since um, that is that is one of the things. So, uh, uh, if you could comment that when you talk about the resilience or infrastructure resilience, uh, how much uh, do you accommodate the other social or uh, political ecological factors, and uh, um, how do you do that? Yeah. Or if you can comment on that one. Yeah, I, you know, and I'm going to be very open with you. I, I, that's something I would love to include in my modeling, and we had a proposal a few years back with the Department of Energy in terms of trying to understand uh, the, the, the other aspects, not only uh, the hydrological or the coastal or the climate or the, like, the other aspects, which is like, for example, what I showed you in terms of uh, the dynamics, the po population dynamics and how it's an, evol an evolving system. And I think, you know, as, as you include more and more complexity, I think you would have more and more uncertainty associated with the answer that you get out of it too, right? Because every, every sort of model or every projection comes with a lot of associated uncertainty. And one thing uh, that I always think of is how complex my model should be, right? And how much parameters I would add to it. And at the end of the day, uh, will, I get, like, will, will I get the answer I'm looking for? So, uh, a large aspect of, uh, I think that what you're saying is very interesting, uh, but a large aspect of it is to also understand if, if we were to like plug in other models, uh, understand the uncertainty associated with each model and how it's propagating from one component to another. Uh, but I think it is a very important aspect that I have not done, but that's like, that's what I'm hoping to do in the future. Yeah, and, and the particular reason why I was asking you this question is, is I'm presently working at the University of Hamburg um, at an institute which look into climate change and security, where we are looking into those security aspects and how we can develop the yeah. base modeling where we can look into all the security aspects we can fit put in uh, for you. So I was, I was sort of expecting that you could put, shed some light on that one um, so that we can also look into that thing. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Nan. I have a question from uh, Dr. Mustafa Rahman. Uh, and question is, do you agree if you can redevelop a past event, then you can say that your model is good? Uh, I don't like, you know, all event, all models are wrong. Some are useful. Uh, we, we mainly like, look at historical events to sort of have a confidence in the model. But we know if I'm doing a projection 10, 20, 15 years from now, there are so many things that are changing in the built environment, right? Not only the climate. So it comes with a lot of uncertainty. So I can't say, oh, my model replicated Hurricane Sandy in 2012 uh, with a confidence interval of, that was very high which means now if I do a projection 50 years from now, then I still have a high confidence interval. No, I can't, I can't, that's, that's not how, it, yeah, you know, it's, yeah. But at the end, I think understanding it from a probabilistic perspective could be useful. Yeah. Okay. So Craig, it's yours, I guess. Do we have any uh, further questions from anyone? Okie doke. Uh, um, so if there's no uh, 
other questions, I'd just like to thank uh, Firas again, and um, I hope everyone has a, a, a good day, and, and uh, good evening or good night to, for those in, in Bangladesh. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone, and I appreciate the time that you, you put to come to my talk, and I, I look forward to hopefully one day collaborating with you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Good evening. Bye. Thanks.